So here comes all the numbers. Now, I, ha I, I don't memorize these numbers, so I'm going to look at the slides just like you guys. Uh, the big fact here is that there's about a half million in population growth that's coming between now and 2050, and another 300,000 households. Job growth is robust at 300,000. Uh, in fact, your unemployment rate is one of the nicest in the whole country. In fact, that unemployment rate signals that you actually need more people here um, in order to create a competitive job market. So you, you, have, you have to create the right kind of environment to draw people in to this community. And even if you don't, you still have growth to cope with. You are the growth center of Ohio. And it's kind of astounding to look at these numbers. You're growing 25%. The rest of Ohio is losing population. 3% by 3%. So you have this great asset. So, you know, I don't know what I'm doing here. You have no crises <laughs> and you have, you have solid growth. Why bother thinking about it? Um, maybe the reason you're in good shape is because you continue to bother about thinking about the future. And that's, I, I would always applaud, applaud. This is the big shift that you have to get your brain around and think through. 44% uh, of new households in this next 35 years are going to be seniors. What kind of housing do they need? Where do they want to live? How can it be an affordable lifestyle for them and a complete, you know, socially robust life? Um, the, the normal growth segment of the wage earner and family population is down at 31%, and you have a big jump in the young people, which is good. You could probably handle an even bigger jump in young people. You probably want more people graduating out of Ohio State staying here. So um, it's a completely new uh, market in terms of what kind of housing fits. And it seems radical, but unfortunately, the demographics are radical. And so the response has to be radical. And these numbers, if you look at the third bar over, um, what you see is the increment. And now this isn't age group, this is household type. Singles living alone will be 55% of new household formation. So of those 300,000 new houses, they got to be for over half of them have to be for single people. Uh, excuse me, that doesn't fit large lot subdivisions. That's not the answer to that question. Um, households without children, that's the empty nesters, that's the young couples, uh, that's 31%. Only 19% are traditional families with kids. And so there's, there's a, you know, a dramatic shift, as I've already pointed out. And the ending numbers, but that seems weird, crazy, uh, you know, maybe unbalanced. But when you blend that in growth increment with the existing population, you're still in a pretty nice balance. 34% senior, uh, single people living alone, 38% are families without children, and 28%, which is like the national norm now of traditional families with kids. But, I mean, a little more than a quarter. So you're still a little more family oriented than the rest of the country. Uh, this is, uh, housing preference by age group. And the long and short here, when you unpack it, is that, of course, it's the small lot and attached housing that really dominates as you get older and when you're younger. There's a time in life for that large lot single family. It's not your entire life. And that's why communities need a whole range of housing types. And the problem with the suburbs have been that we decided that, that it's, as I said before, it's one size fits all. It's one housing type for everybody. Uh, and there are whole communities that either force people into something that's not quite a good fit, or they end up with one segment of the full demographic. Now, that has lots of interesting implications. What I keep hearing when I come here is that schools are a big issue. Well. Looking forward, clearly, we're not going to generate as many kids per household as, we, as you had. And so the, the, the overall school population, while not declining, will level off. And that, 
that push-pull. But the real issue here is the distribution of school-age kids. When you have whole communities that have nothing but families with kids and whole communities where you don't have families with kids and you have local tax structures that you know, basically live off local income tax and local property tax, you have huge asymmetries. So those communities that have a lot of schools and a lot of school-age kids are struggling to make ends meet because they don't have households without kids to contribute to their tax base. And they do. So there's a, a wonderful synergy that could evolve here, which is if you have places for those empty nesters to go, not leave their community, but actually move to a townhouse or a cottage or an, a condo, but stay in their community, they become taxpayers that contribute to the schools without contributing kids. And all of a sudden, that gets back into balance. So balanced communities are really a, an important idea, both socially and economically. And part of what this whole exercise is beginning to reveal is that you have that opportunity to get to. Um, home type, attached, small lot. So you'll notice here at the bottom, small lot, we're saying zero need. Now, that doesn't mean we're saying there's no new single family large lot developed here. Uh, it's saying that the market demand is pretty small, given the demographics, and that people entering that market will, if there's a healthy turnover of single family, there's plenty of inventory to handle it. So people leaving single family homes will free up capacity for people who are entering that phase of life. Um, and yes, there'll always be you know, the next really high-end community for somebody who wants to buy something brand new. But there's a lot of people who enjoy just moving into a mature neighborhood and fixing up a house that hopefully has been left by um, some empty nesters who have moved to a local residence. That's not going to happen if the city doesn't allow that multifamily or that townhouse or that small lot development to happen. And so therein lies the whole issue. And you know, I, I may be spending too much time on this, but <laughs> it's, it's really a, a fundamental paradigm shift that it's hard for people to understand. I get pushback all the time from people saying, you're attacking the American dream. You know, the American dream is a large house and cars and mobility and freedom. Uh, and I just say, well, yeah, but if you're 75 years old, driving a lot doesn't, and maintaining a yard really isn't what you want. And actually, if you're 25, you probably would rather be downtown in a cool urban location. So it's really who you're talking about when you make those global statements about what America wants.